this computer recording in progress. All right, Terry, it is all you. You are the host. Thank you very much. Thank you. Host disabled participant screen sharing. That's fine. I don't need to do that. No, but I, I can't share my screen. You, you oh, forbidden didn't... sharing my screen. Oh, no, I didn't do that. OK, it's OK. It just came up. Okay. It's fixed. All right, Let's see if I can get this. Um, It's the wrong one. Sorry, just trying to get my, just trying to get my, uh, there it is, PowerPoint shared. Now you should be seeing my PowerPoint if this is working. Yeah, we got it, Terry. Phew. Yeah, that's the wrong PowerPoint. Try this one. Now, is that working now? Do you get the full screen PowerPoint? Yeah. Yep. Full okay. screen. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction and good evening, everyone. So, uh, this should be fun. Um, I'd like to talk to you about old roads coming in and out of the uh, Halifax Dartmouth area from, uh, let's go back thousands of years just for the, just for the uh, thrill of it. So for thousands of years, the ancestral Mi'kmaq used canoe routes, including portages, as well as coastal and inland trails throughout what we now call Nova Scotia. There were two major canoe routes that terminated at uh, Chibuktuk or Chibukto, as we say in English, that means far reaching waters. When Europeans arrived and began map making, they sometimes noted the existence of these ancient routes. There we go. So um, this is a map that uh, was made by uh, an unidentified Frenchman. It might have been uh, it might have been de la Ba. Uh, it's from uh, the French archives, and it's undated, but uh, it's probably roughly 1700. De la Ba made some maps that are dated of Halifax Harbor that date to 1711. So this is like a rough draft, but uh, it has some interesting points here. So if you look over here on the far right, I've enlarged this little section where it has a capital letter F. And then over here, uh, sort of the middle left, there's the capital letter G. And those letters are explained in the legend, which I'm going to enlarge for you. And uh, so if you can't read French, basically it says that F represents the river that goes to the Les Min or Minas um, and has three portages. Whereas G, which basically is at Dartmouth Cove, it's another river that also goes to Minas. And so that is obviously accessing the, G accesses the Shubenacadie uh, River watershed, which if you follow the Shubenacadie River to its mouth, and then uh, paddle along the shore of Minas Basin, you can also get to Minas or, or Kentville uh, going that way. So these were the two canoe routes that um, uh, converged on the Halifax Harbor Bedford Basin area. So this is another map that was made by the British in 1755. And I've just added some colored lines to it to um, so we can more clearly see it here uh, instead of the black and white that uh, you usually see where all the lines kind of blend together. And we'll talk more about this map later on. But right now, I just want to point out this green dotted line, which on the map, it says an Indian path to the lakes. And it, it follows. This is Lake Binoc. This is the Lake McMack. And this would be Lake Charles and Lake William over here. Uh, so it just shows that even in 1755, the um, British were able to um, find and, and record these ancient Mi'kmaq roots. 
So portage trails exist between watersheds and around falls and rapids. Other inland trails also exist that often follow along the top of bedrock ridges. Sometimes the Mi'kmaq made a trail to shortcut long coastal paddling around a peninsula. And there's a well-known example of that called Indian Path in Lunenburg County. So this is Lunenburg. Uh, this is the big Kingsburg Peninsula that's very indented and certainly a long way around by paddling from La Have, which is here. So the Mi'kmaq had this shortcut, which is referred to as Indian Path. Uh, whoops. This is a uh, French map from 1744 by Bellin, and it shows the fort at La Have, as well as the uh, La Have River and other smaller rivers. And here's a small river that has the following uh, annotation. It says in French, uh, river where there is the portage that goes to Mirlegoish, which would be Lunenburg. So the Europeans did record that Mi'kmaq trail as well. And today, it, the uh, modern road follows along quite closely to Indian Path down in Lunenburg County. Uh, if that sort of topic interests you, there's a really good uh, book on that subject called Indian Path Common. Uh, and uh, so I'd recommend you have a look at that if, uh, if it's a topic of interest. So turning uh, ahead now fr uh, from the uh, Mi'kmaq trails and routes and looking at Acadian roads. During the prime Acadian period uh, from 1605 to 1749, uh, and I say prime because after 1749, uh, the British really uh, put the screws to the Acadians. So they were no longer masters in their own house, even though technically, um, the British were in authority from 1710 or 1713. Uh, until 1749, the Acadians could pretty much uh, skirt them. But uh, after 1749 and the presence at Halifax, they had to toe the British line for the most part. Um, so for both the Mi'kmaq and the Acadians, water transport was usually their first choice. There weren't really any roads or very few. Um, either by birch bark canoe or wooden boat. In some cases, overland travel was more practical. And so a prominent example is the uh, route from Pisiquid, which we now think of as Windsor, Nova Scotia, to Halifax or Shibukto. The Acadians would drive their cattle over this road. Uh, it's some extent it's paralleled by Highway 1 from Fort Sackville in Bedford to Fort Edward in Windsor. And this was originally, of course, a Mi'kmaq portage route, as we just mentioned earlier, uh, following the Sackville River and, and also Weir Brook and the St. Croix River. Uh, the Acadians made the trail into a road so they could drove their cattle over it. And this was important because, uh, well, to the Acadians living in Pisiquid especially, from 1715, when uh, Lewisburg was uh, built and needed a lot of uh, food and the Acadians wanted to supply that market until 1749 when, the, when they could no longer use that road to sneak food to the French. So this road allowed the Acadians to smuggle cattle to French ships that came to Chibucto or Bedford from Lewisburg. Without the British at Fort Anne, well, or to do, doing so without the British at Fort Anne being able to really prevent it, although they did try. Here's a French map dated 1739. Um, for some reason, the author isn't popping into my head, but it's, it's in the cartouche there. Uh, and um, so let's zoom in on parts of this map. And here's Beauvaisin, and there's the portage route indicated from Beauvaisin to Bay Vert. And there's also the uh, portage route from Cobequit, or in other words, Truro, to Tatamugush. And that's a famous French road which has received a lot of uh, interest. Uh, and uh, some folks have actually traced it out even now, even, although it's a lost road, but people have found it. And that's quite interesting. Um, but let's focus in on the Halifax area. So this uh, is Halifax Harbor on this map. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor there circling. And um, 
by the way, can you see my cursor? Just to make sure. Yeah, Gordon. Yep. Thank you. Uh, this is Grand Pre, and this is Pisiquet, or in other words, Windsor. And there is this portage route. And in French, it says portage from Pisiquet or Windsor to Chibacto or Bedford or Halifax uh, for the transport of the cattle. And incidentally, this uh, road from um, Grand Pre or Minas to uh, Port Royal is also indicated on this map over here as well. So there were a few roads in the Akkadian period. And actually there were a few more than is shown on this map, but you know, the, they weren't everywhere. They were, they were uh, precious roads, let's say. Here is another map by Belin dated 1744. And it also has a few of these roads indicated, actually not quite as many of them, but there are a few of the ones I mentioned earlier are still shown here. And uh, I'm gonna highlight what would be the route from Bedford to uh, Windsor in green. It's actually not on this map. It's, it's a bit of a mapping error because they have shown a portage route from the head of St. Margaret's Bay to uh, Windsor. And, and it's true that was a real route, but it wasn't the major one. That was, you know, um, a sort of a difficult backwoods portage route. They weren't taking cattle by that <laughs> route by any means. So Belin got a little mixed up. He's calling it a road rather than a portage. So really this green line should be the road and this dashed one is, is only a portage. So uh, just as a caution, when you look at these old historical maps, you have to be very careful because um, it, they're not always totally accurate. In fact, almost always have quite a few major flaws. So you, uh, you have to use them with a grain of salt. All right, so we've discussed the Mi'kmaq and the uh, Akkadian uh, use of uh, road building and trails and so on. Our main focus tonight is gonna be the British activity. So after the British founded Halifax in 1749, they began road building for military purposes. And initially they hired the Acadians to improve the road from Fort Sackville to Fort Edward. Even though the British had um, a fairly large number of people here, they were extremely busy building their settlement, uh, cutting down the forest, building their forts, uh, building their homes, uh, the roads in town even. <clears throat> they didn't have extra time to work on these roads out in the wilderness. So that's what they, uh, they use the Acadians to do. For the most part, most of the British roads um, for the first, you know, 100 years or so were done by Acadians. And uh, the first one they set to was this one we were just been discussing from Fort Sackville to Fort Edward, so that it could be uh, used more effectively to transport military materials and troops. And although I won't get into it uh, tonight that much, uh, there's of course a very famous example of the, the Battle of St. Croix that occurred in 1750, almost immediately uh, uh, right on that road. So you can look that up. Um, so the British also used Acadian labor to extend this Windsor Road all the way to Halifax itself because initially it didn't do that. In the Acadian period, it only went as far as Bedford. So here's another French map. Uh, it's undated, but since Halifax is shown on the map, it has to be about 1750 or, or slightly afterwards. And they have drawn in a red line here uh, to represent the road from Bedford to uh, Windsor. And actually they've extended it to Grand Pre, which in fact it did extend that far. This map has a number of flaws. Uh, so um, it has a few interesting points as well. It, it also shows more explicitly the portage route from uh, the head of St. Margaret's Bay. And it says uh, portage uh, over three lakes to, uh, to uh, travel between the, the uh, south coast of, of Acadia to Minas. Uh, so we were discussing that on the other map. Just wanted to point out that it's shown here separately from this uh, road, which this uh, main road from Windsor to Bedford, the legend says that it's 50 feet wide. 
uh, and it's used to uh, travel from Halifax to Minas. Uh, I don't know that it was 50 feet wide at that point. It may have been. It may have been a bit of an exaggeration. I'm not entirely sure, but it's interesting to have it there in any case. All right, so the original British military roads in Nova Scotia were usually cut in fairly straight segments, linking, linking the tops of high hills. Now here we're talking about the ones that the British uh, you know, engineered themselves. Of course, that's in contrast to earlier Acadian roads, which, you know, since they were mainly intended to carry um, either uh, cattle or, or wagon loads of uh, agricultural produce, they wanted to stick to the contours of the land as much as possible. Also, of course, Mi'kmaq trails were more interested in following the water resources, although they did also have ridgetop trails too. Now the military roads that the British built, um, there was a logic to their approach. They wanted to acquire high ground. They didn't want to be in the valleys any more than they had to be. Uh, and also they wanted to be as straight as possible because the whole point was to get their troops and equipment uh, from A to B as quickly as possible. How much energy that took going up and down those hills was not a military concern. <laughs> you just did it or else. Um, however, later when the same roads were used for commercial purposes, it was no longer a good fit. So here's one of the first uh, actual British maps that shows the road situation. It dates to 1755. And uh, it's often uh, referred to as the Captain Lewis map, but I'm pretty sure it was actually uh, Morris, Charles Morris that made it. Uh, but he does have a lot of information here. So um, that, that three lake portage that we were just talking about on the, whoops, didn't mean to do that, on the previous map is actually shown here as a dotted line going through uh, uh, Panook Lake. Uh, although this, uh, di digital version that I have cuts off a lot of it. I, I don't have the other part to show you, but anyway, there, there it was. Uh, it was a bigger map at one time, and this is Saint Margaret's Bay, of course. And so the the Captain Lewis survey line uh, does go, in fact, from uh, Halifax or uh, Fairview Cove, Dutch Village, uh, through the woods all the way to head of Saint Margaret's, and then on to uh, Chester and Mahone Bay. But uh, Captain Lewis only surveyed the line. He, um, there was no actual road building yet. And it was obviously done in wintertime because you can see he takes advantage of any lakes by going right over them. So they were obviously frozen. Um, but the, there are a few other roads. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on this map in a minute. So already in 1755, we see the beginnings of the major roads connecting the Halifax area to the wider mainland. From the downtown core, the road to Windsor later become Highway 1 and extend to Kentville, Annapolis, the North Shore, and eventually all the way to Yarmouth. From Lower Sackville, the road to Cobequid, uh, now we know it as Truro, later became Highway 2. From Fairview Cove, the road to head of St. Margaret's Bay later became Highway 3. We were just talking about that one and it extended to Lunenburg, the South Shore, and eventually Yarmouth as well. And I haven't pointed out yet, but from Dartmouth Cove, the road to Lawrencetown and later became Highway 7 and extended eventually to Sherbrooke and Antigonish. So let's come back to that map and see those now. So here we have the Citadel at Halifax and Windsor Street uh, or Windsor Road, as it was known in those days, that followed uh, around Bedford Basin to Fort Sackville, and then from there on to Pisiquid or, or uh, Windsor. So that would be Highway 1. And then Highway 2, uh, so far it was also only a survey line that started from Lower Sackville through the woods. In this case, it goes around the northwest side of Grand Lake or Shubenacadie Lake. We'll speak more about that in a few minutes. And then uh, Highway 3 would have started in Dartmouth and, oh no, sorry, Highway 3 was this one to the South Shore. Highway 7 started in Dartmouth and went to Lawrencetown because in 1755, the British founded Lawrencetown 
on the eastern shore uh, and they cut this road out to it. It didn't last that long though because it came under a number of severe Mi'kmaq attacks and so they eventually uh, fairly soon after this um, abandoned Lawrencetown for a while. Oh yeah, so I should also probably mention the Waverly Road uh, from Dartmouth. There's, as I mentioned earlier, this um, Indian trail uh, that followed the lakes. And there was almost certainly a parallel one on the other side as well, although it's not shown on the map, but eventually uh, we do see that show up on maps. Uh, so yeah, the Waverly Road from Dartmouth over Redbridge Pond and through Portobello also had an early date and likely initially followed the Mi'kmaq Trail. Given the Mi'kmaq presence at Red Ridge Pond and the petroglyphs on Miller Mountain, we're going to come back to that when we talk about Dartmouth more in detail later. Uh, and I mentioned the parallel trails, right? All right, so now we're coming back to that same map, and this time I've colored it in so uh, we can see those roads that we've been discussing a little more clearly. <clears throat> The shallow uh, tidal areas on this map have actually been uh, uh, highlighted a little bit with this um, different kind of shading, texturing. And so that's in the original map, although the colors uh, are something that I added. But uh, yeah, so the Lawrencetown Road was uh, this purple line, and then uh, the Windsor Road, the other purple line. Um, there was also the beginnings of this Dartmouth Road that we know today as Dartmouth Road from Bedford uh, to this looks like uh, Lily Lake yeah, on halfway between Bedford and Waverly. Um, and then you can also see the uh, West Peninsula Road here that had three peninsular blockhouses on it in 1755 as well, going from the Northwest Arm. So, uh, yeah, so let's move on from that then. So, as I mentioned, uh, the, the roads uh, to Hebe St. Margaret's and to Cabaquid at this point were not real roads. They were just survey tracks. Um, and I mentioned the fact that Lawrencetown and its road would be abandoned uh, due to the Mi'kmaq attacks. Okay, so here's another map from the same period, 1755. And to emphasize those points, really the only road shown is from Halifax around Bedford Basin to Fort Sackville and then to Fort Edward. Uh, if you look closely, there is another road and here it's showing us from Fort Edward, but uh, they've got Fort Edward on the wrong side of the St. Croix, another one of these mapping errors. Um, uh, anyway, that did go from that side of the St. Croix along uh, the Knoll shore to Cabaquid. And of course, there were also Acadian and Mi'kmaq trails from Cabaquid to Beaubassin as well. So they do show those. Interestingly, they're shown with the same sort of um, type or iconography uh, as the main uh, road from uh, Windsor to Bedford. So they probably were really quite similar. I don't think this one was 50 feet wide. It would have been given a little more prominence on the map, you would think, if that was the case. Now, this is another Morris map from 1761, and it, it really only shows the road from uh, Bedford to Windsor, it doesn't even bother with the one around the basin. Um, it was probably a, a much smaller, uh, rougher trail uh, at this point in time. And uh, Morris didn't maybe feel it deserved to be uh, even shown. He does show the trail going past Windsor uh, to uh, Horton and then on to Cornwallis or what we think of as Kentville now as well. So the British were making use of those uh, trails and expanding them. Here's another map by Charles Morris, also dating to 1761, and again shows that uh, set of roads we were just discussing, as well as the one from Minas to Annapolis. 
And interestingly, it's also given some prominence to the track from Lower Sackville to Cavaquit or Truro. And although it's somewhat stylized, I think, because of these very straight segments. Now, as I mentioned, the military plan was to make them as straight as possible from high point to high point. So probably this was the order that was given, make a road like this, but there's no way they actually did it like that. It was a lot more twisty uh, in real life. So yeah, again, you take that with a grain of salt. The uh, Windsor Road, of course, had been in use for at least 40 years already by 1750. And if you think of it as a Mi'kmaq portrait trail, probably for millennia, whereas the leg from Halifax, uh, downtown core to Fort Sackville was uh, newly cut in 1749, only gradually improved over time, mostly by Acadian labor. Some of it was as prisoners of war. This next map, 1768, uh, shows all the roads we've been discussing and a few other ones. And uh, now we see a, a, a genuine road uh, having been put through from Halifax to Mahone Bay and Lunenburg. Um, the, uh, so that's the beginning of the number three highway. Uh, we also see the uh, Windsor Road wrapping around Bedford Basin. Uh, to Fort Sackville and, and on to points further north and west. Uh, and we also see a very small indication, not at the same uh, uh, prominence, of, of this beginnings of Highway 2 wrapping around the northwest side of Shubenacadie Lake. And it sort of peters out at that point, so um, it was still quite rough. Uh, the Lawrencetown Road is still there, so it may well have been, uh, I think by now, uh, Lawrencetown was probably reoccupied and the, the uh, road to Lawrencetown, the, what later became the number seven highway was uh, again improved. So talking about the Bedford Highway now that runs along the west shore of the Bedford Basin, um, Today, it's quite close to the water, but originally it followed the high ground to a much greater extent from hilltop to hilltop. Now, there isn't a real definitive map that shows that. You do see it in some of the ones we've already been seeing. Uh, so here you have the Windsor Road that when it gets to Dutch Village or Fairview Cove, it kind of splits. One part goes towards Bedford, the other part goes towards uh, St. Margaret's. And then you can see it's shown as quite distant from the shore in, in a lot of places. And you might think, well, that's just a rough map. You know, it's a fairly large scale. We couldn't expect it to show all the little wiggles, although it does show a lot of those wiggles on the uh, Dartmouth side. Uh, and in fact, I think it, it's probably more accurate than you would think, because we do have some other maps that um, that show it a little bit more in, in, in detail. And this is one of the best, really. It's a, a map by Toller dating to 1809. Uh, and, and here I'm showing you the whole map. It's a big map and it goes into a great uh, level of detail. I won't um, look into the whole map because we, we, you know, we only have so much time, but I do want to show you one section of it uh, here at the end of Bedford Basin. So we're going to zoom in on this section here, um, which is the north end of Bedford Basin. And what we have up here at the top, and uh, you probably can't read it, but this is actually Prince's Lodge. And the rotunda is that little red dot right there, quite close to the water. Uh, and, and so there, there is, at this point in 1809, the uh, Bedford Highway does track the water's edge fairly well. But, but then there is this other road that is much further inland on the high ground. And if we zoom in on that, it says old road to Sackville. So it seems like that original work that started in 1750 did in fact follow the high ground that um, you know was sort of expected from the uh, military um, theory 
as well as uh, shown on a lot of the large scale maps. So even this small scale map now, although it's at a later date, does show it in that alignment as an old road to Sackville. Some people have told me that they have been able to find evidence of this in the woods. Um, I haven't myself, although I haven't really looked that hard for it, but um, you know, I, I think there's, there's some anecdotal evidence that we may be able to still find pieces of it. Although today this area is pretty heavily built up with housing developments, like especially here, this is actually uh, paper mill uh, brook. And uh, this would be the uh, Hammonds Plains Road. Although now the Hammonds Plains Road is on the other side of Paper Mill, Paper Mill Brook, but at, uh, at this point it was on the west side. Um, and uh, there's one right here. Yeah, Alex, maybe you want to mute as you're coming through. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so. The point is, there are, there may be still some sections of this old road that you could find in the woods that have not been destroyed by housing development. That's an interesting uh, thought. Oops, I guess I do have one more zoom level here. We can almost read Road to Hammonds Plains. Uh, so this is like Moyers Mill and uh, DeWolf Park and so on today. All right, so let's switch gears now and talk about the road from Halifax to the South Shore. Um, it was discussed and planned and many times in the 1750s and 1760s, but nothing really happened. A usable road did not uh, come into reality until the 1770s. And unlike the road to Windsor, the road to Chester and Home Bay could not follow high ground to any great extent. Uh, there were just too many rivers to cross and usually fairly close to their mouths. Also a lot of lakes and frequent swamps. The Morris map of, eight, of 1784 may be the earliest portrayal of the first usable alignment of the road to the South Shore. If somebody knows an earlier map that has it, I'd love to know about it. I've just not come across it. <clears throat> so this one started from Fairview Cove or Dutch Village. It went up Main Avenue uh, to the top of Geyser Hill, where the uh, driving range is and the TV tower uh, today, <laughs> and uh, went from hilltop to hilltop from there up till the crossing of Nine Mile River, which is uh, just a bit past uh, Timberley. Um, and from Nine Mile River, it followed more or less the existing Highway 3 route, although this is uh, an oversimplification and, and we're gonna talk about that some more. Now, when I say the uh, 1784 Morris map, there, there is more than one. This is one of the most interesting. It's pretty rough. Uh, it shows property boundary survey of Beach Hill. And of course, Beach Hill is where um, at a later time, the, uh, some of the black refugees uh, settled, um, also known as Refugee Hill. Uh, and, and this is uh, Governor Lake over here and Bears Lake over here. And these are some of the uh, B lots for the uh, Dutch settlers, you know, the, the B lots of Dutch village. There were A and B lots. The A lots were down closer to the Dutch village road. Um, but it's hard to, to make out, but in, in sort of um, faded characters here, it says uh, road from Halifax to Lunenburg. And if I rotate this map so that north is up, uh, and, and so now these lots uh, are, are aligned the way they would be on a, on a modern map, um, you can see the way that this uh, road would run. Uh, it sort of ran from Dutch Village on the north side of Governor Lake. So that's very interesting. We're gonna look at that a lot more now. So this is the other 1784 map by Charles Morris, and it's a lot better, really. Um, we can see this road, Windsor Street goes up here to Fairview Cove, Dutch Village, splits into one part goes to Bedford. And, and so this is Main Avenue, and here it is at the top of Geyser Hill. And then from there, it goes through a fairly straight track going from hilltop to hilltop 
And the Nine Mile River is somewhere around here. We've got another map that's going to show it more clearly. Uh, and then uh, to head of St. Margaret's. And then more or less following the track of today's number three highway. And already uh, the uh, number 14 uh, from Chester to Windsor is, is already shown on this map. But by the way, um, we have these highway numbers, Highway 1, Windsor Road, Highway 2, Cabaquid Road, Highway 3, uh, St. Margaret's Bay Road, and so on and so on. They went up, in, back in the day, they went up into the 30s, I think, although they were only continuous, as far as I know, up to 23. Um, I'm not going to tell you what they all were, but it's interesting that number 13 seems to have been skipped. I can find the uh, numbers for all the roads up to 23, never found a number 13. I think they deliberately skipped it for superstitious reasons. Just a little point of trivia there as we go through. All right, back to the South Shore Road. Um, oh yeah, interesting. It seems to show right along this alignment, uh, a survey track for another road that was never built. Uh, but the first part of it follows more or less where the Hammonds Plains Road uh, did go through eventually. So it looks like perhaps the Hammonds Plains Road was originally intended to go all the way to Windsor through the interior. Uh, it's sort of opening up the interior for development and settlement. Um, this is just my supposition. I've not seen any documentation on that, but then again, I haven't gone looking for it. I just noticed that recently. Uh, so that, that may be something there of interest. Right, so instead the Hammonds Plains Road ended up connecting to the head of St. Margaret's Bay. So over the next 50 years, there were quite a few more roads heading west from Halifax. We're gonna talk about a few of them now. Uh, the old Annapolis Coach Road branched off from Hammonds Plains Road at English Corner around 1826. It was intended to promote settlement of the interior of the province, such as at the 40s and New Ross. The Prospect Road and the old St. Margaret's Bay Coach Road were also put through it around this time. Uh, so we're gonna talk more about all of that. This is a really old map of the Prospect Road. I think it's the original surveyor's line for when he, when he put in the first survey. Uh, but this end, we actually have Fairview Cove and Dutch Village. And this is actually Dutch Village Road joining the Northwest Arm. This is the Northwest Arm here. And then from the Northwest Arm, this is more or less what we would now call Herring Cove Road. Although it definitely wasn't called that at the time. It, at this point, it's more or less the Prospect Road. Uh, and um, it does go all the way to Prospect down here, Prospect. So interesting little uh, cup shape in the, in the road here, which uh, we're going to notice on subsequent maps. That's why I pointed out. But 1828 is still quite uh, early for, the, for this Prospect Road. All right, so 1834. Now we see um, a lot more roads showing up. And here's the Hammonds Plains Road that uh, has gone to head of St. Margaret's now. And also the Annapolis Coach Road that branches off of it at English Corner, now known as the Pockwalk Road. And in fact, there's Pockwalk Lake right there. Following Pockwalk Lake, it's currently uh, lost or there may be a very small traceable track if you're uh, a good hiker, uh, you might find some of it. And it does show up again in this area. It's actually not that hard to find in, in uh, north of St. Margaret's Bay. It's quite fun actually to hike it if you can come across it and track it for a while. Uh, so this was termed the Wellington Military Settlement that didn't really succeed. Uh, long story there. Uh, there was also the Dalhousie military settlement on along the same road. That's more like around the 40s area. So yeah, this it's a long, complex story about those attempts, but it does go all the way to Annapolis Royal. Here's another 1836 map. 
that this time it's a large scale map and it's only showing major roads, but that uh, um, 18, 1826 uh, Old Annapolis Coach Road is, is certainly in its heyday here, shown as a major road, along with what we now think of as Highway 3, uh, Highway 2, Highway 7, although, although this is, no, this is not Highway 7, actually, this is something else that, that's going like to, uh, Myers Grant, uh, the old Guysboro Road, I guess is what we what it would be. Um, I actually, that one is not on my radar, so that's uh, that's all you're going to hear about it tonight in this talk. But the curious thing is that they've completely dropped Highway One. I'm not sure. Again, I think it's a mapping error. I don't think Highway One really fell into disuse at all in 1836. So you got to watch those mapping errors. They'll come and bite you uh, anytime they can. Okay, so I mentioned this. Oh yeah, so uh, only a few sections of the old St. Margaret's Bay Coach Road remain as modern roads. And let's look at that a little bit. So here is a map made by um, Charles Fairbanks in 1846. Uh, and it shows the plan for the brand new Halifax Waterworks and how they're gonna flood Chain Lakes and Long Lake uh, the dark blue is what the water level was naturally, and the lighter blue is the area to be flooded. There's a big dam here in Spryfield uh, to make Long Lake a lot bigger. And of course, there's a dam here, although it only um, brings the lake up a little bit at the Chain Lake. And there is uh, Chocolate Lake there uh, as well. So um, the road to uh, the uh, Beach Beach Hill is is here. This is the road to Beach Hill, and uh, or, or what we now think was the Bay Road in modern times, and also this was what we would think of as the Heron Cove Road in modern times. Uh, it wraps around here, just around the Spryfield Mall area, and then comes back around this way uh, to the uh, what we think of as the old uh, Sambro Road uh, on its way to Prospect. That actually says prospect there, enlarge it a little bit. It's upside down, but it says to prospect. So this is that cup shape that I was showing you on the prospect road survey. It's, uh, it shows up here again. Um, so is this the prospect road or is this the St. Margaret's Bay coach road? It's actually both at this point. Uh, and let's look at that some more. So there was a part that became known as Darts Crossroad that I'm going to highlight in a second. And also around the Indian Lake Golf Club, it ran, uh, ran from there to Glen Margaret. Uh, we're going to look at that in just a second. But first, I want to just sh show you this uh, 1871 map that has a Northwest Arm, Chocolate Lake. I've chopped it off, but it also has the Bay Road labeled exactly where we normally find the Bay Road today. But on top of it, it still had St. Margaret's Bay Road as the labeling for what we would now think of as the Herring Cove Road. All right, so this is the Faribault map of 1908. And um, this is, uh, Northwest Arm, Melville Island, again, Herring Cove Road, and there's that cup shape again coming out this way. It's uh, on a different angle now because we finally got true north uh, straight up and down. Um, and so this is where it splits from the old Sambro Road uh, to either the Prospect Road or the St. Margaret's Bay Road, they're combined here. And so this is that dark crossroad. You can see the word dark there. That's uh, the dark family had a home here and they also had a mill over here on this brook. Um, so the dark crossroad was a major road back in the day. Today, it's at most a, a very rough uh, hiking trail. Uh, and uh, So here, by now, an additional crossroad has come from 
today's Bay Road uh, up around uh, the Chain Lakes, an additional crossroad was put through, which they are now calling the Prospect Road, even though this Dart Crossroad was the original Prospect Road. So it can be very confusing. You have to be very careful. Roads change names, and uh, they can be more than one name for the same road, and and more than uh, one road with with the same name. <laughs> If that makes any sense, but it is very confusing. Anyway, here is the split to Prospect versus St. Margaret's. And so let's um, color that in a little bit, make it a little clearer. So the green sections are what's left of the old St. Margaret's Bay Coach Road by any other name that you can still drive on today. And the blue sections you might be able to find as a hiker if you are very good at finding old roads in the woods because uh, there's almost nothing left of it. And here from what we now think of as Highway 333, uh, it suddenly becomes uh, main road again. Uh, but then at the golf course, uh, Indian Lake Golf Course, it, uh, it reverts back to a hiking trail. And, and this is a really a great hiking trail. Um, I, I'm not sure how much use it gets. I think it gets a lot of use. Here it's actually labeled the old St. Margaret's Bay Road. If you're at all interested, there's a great book on the subject, Walking Guide to the Old St. Margaret's Bay Road. It has a lot of historical tips and it's completely free, 48 pages. And uh, it came out in 2010. This is the, uh, this is the URL, to, uh, the link to uh, get your own copy. I, I do recommend it, it's a great book. All right, so how did Highway 3 uh, that goes up by uh, Chocolate Lake come to its present alignment? As we were seeing a few minutes ago, it originally went up Main Avenue and then on the northern side of uh, Governor Lake. But at some point, that section west of Gaja Hill was abandoned. And we know why, because people didn't want to go up that big hill for the, simply the privilege of coming down the other side. <laughs> they would much rather go around it. Uh, so that's, there's a story behind how that came about. Uh, now let's look at this later map. Uh, this edition I have was printed in 1893, although it was actually drawn in 1886 by Akers. Uh, it's often referred to as the Hopkins map. I, I forget the relationship between Hopkins and Acres. They, they work together somehow. Uh, so let's zoom in on it a little bit. And uh, so interestingly, there are two Margaret's Bay roads uh, listed here. Um, and really, there could be a third one because uh, the one we were talking about earlier is a third Margaret's Bay road that, that would actually run over here and, and then go you know, at below the bottom edge of the map. Uh, so forget that one for now. And we'll look at this one here, which is what we today call the Bay Road, uh, Chocolate Lake over here, Chain Lakes over here. And, uh, and here it splits off to Highway 333 to, uh, to eventually prospect or Peggy's Cove now, it's put through all that way. Um, but uh, so this is what we call today Highway 3, and here it says uh, by 1886 it's going to St. Margaret's Bay. The old road to St. Margaret's Bay from Geyser Hill is still partially shown as a rough woods trail. By now it has really been abandoned as a road. The, the roads have these double parallel marks, uh, and that stops the Geyser Hill. After that, it's just a rough trail for, for hunters and woodsmen. How did that come about? Because it was the main road at one point. Okay, here's an interesting map uh, that was made in 1903 when the railway was being surveyed, the Halifax uh, Southwestern Railway. And this is Nine Mile River, uh, this larger river here on the left. And this is where Governor's Brook empties into it. Uh, Governor's Lake is over here. So this is Timberley, or uh, yeah, Timberley. And um, so the, the BLT trail that we're familiar with today uh, actually is this red line, sorry, this red line. And uh, so that was where the railway was put through. And this other uh, line is where uh, the number three highway runs today. 
Uh, but originally, it, this part wasn't here. Originally, the number three highway or the St. Margaret's Bay Road crossed Governor's Brook right here and went off into the woods. It actually says right here, road to Dutch Village. Um, and they didn't bother showing the rest of it for the purpose of the railway, but it was there, uh, at least before this time, because by 1903, it had long been abandoned. But so this is a, one of the most interesting roads uh, in uh, the Halifax area. I'm very fond of it. Uh, completely abandoned from Geysers Hill to Nine Mile River. Uh, even the Faribault map only shows a small part of it, uh, really only as far as Governor's Lake. So this whole section was even too uh, long gone, too long abandoned, even to be a trail on the Faribault map. And, and he shows a lot of small trails. So now I'm combining all the maps that I know of that show the um, old uh, Bay Road as a... Uh, in high resolution, uh, and I've combined it with a modern topographical map, and I've, I've sketched in in a gray line. So this is just my uh, own um, speculation as to where it probably ran through the woods. So I've gone through hiking in this area, trying to uh, pick it up and find it, and and I can find it. I'm I'm certain I can find it in a number of places. I have difficulty as I get close to the Six Mile Lake Swamp and Marsh. Uh, have not quite figured out exactly where it runs there yet, but uh, for those of you who like hiking, it's, it's a fun challenge to try to pick this up. Uh, here's a uh, artist's view of uh, what uh, it looked like uh, from Geyser's Hill, the, uh, the old Bay Road, uh, kind of interesting uh, piece of art there. All right, so back to our main story of uh, the, the Bay Road. So Chocolate Lake itself was dammed very early in Halifax history. And then the first chain lake was also dammed by Hosterman uh, to uh, make a reservoir for his mills who, so it feeds Chocolate Lake. So he had a multi-tiered uh, mill pond essentially because even the second chain lake was also dammed a little later and, and had a mill pond reservoir there as well. So of course the black refugees moved from the head of the arm to Beach Hill in 1815. And at first there was only a footpath from Armdale to Beach Hill, but the black refugees needed a proper road. And so they began petitioning and, and uh, getting funds from the government to work on the road. And so eventually it was upgraded as a proper road from Beach uh, Hill or today's Beachville to the Bay Road. So to pick up the story from here, we're going to look at the taller map of 1807. It's a great map, has lots and lots of roads on it. This is uh, Bedford Basin, Fairview Cove, Dutch Village down here. And we're going to look at another part of it just below the bottom edge, which I've colored in a little bit so we can see the lines a little better. In those days, uh, what we call Chocolate Lake was sometimes called Indian Lake. Here's a, uh, a drawing of Indian Lake, the feeder of Hosterman's Mills. So it was another name for Chocolate Lake, just in case you see that and wonder what it is. All right, so now here's one of the maps of the Black Refugees Settlement in what we now know, know as Beachville. Uh, so these were these lots. They were not given clear title to the lots. They only had license to occupy. And this is that same block, which in, um, by 1818, they'd rearranged some of the borders and um, occupied some of this land near Lovett Lake, but it does show this thick black line as the road to Halifax. And you can see that road, which, which goes down to the arm and is effectively what we now know as the Bay Road, came to a dead end right here in Beachville. Meanwhile, um, the, you have this road to St. Margaret's Bay that goes over Geyser Hill and down the other side. So Titus Smith, who was superintendent of roads, had the bright idea in 1832, let's connect the Beachville Road to the western end of the St. Margaret's Bay Road to avoid Geyser Hill. So you can read all this, uh, but basically that's what he's saying. This is a good idea, let's do it. And so that's what they did. They uh, connected 
um, this dotted line and effectively at Nine Mile River uh, cut off this section of the original St. Margaret's Bay Road. And so there were people and farms living here, which you can find from the census uh, as the census taker walks along here and, and visits the various homesteads along this road and identifies who they are. Although the location isn't given, you know, in terms of so many miles or anything, but you know, you, we can tell by the names and, and the property uh, deeds going with those names, roughly where they fell along this road. Those were all abandoned. And uh, I have found some cellar holes along here. And, and I think there's more that I have not yet found. So that's one of the other interests of finding this old alignment of the Bay Road north of Governor Lake. Anyway, just to summarize, here's a modern map. Uh, and so the purple line is the first St. Margaret's Bay Road over Geysers Hill, um, and roughly 1770 uh, was when it was put through. And then here is the footpath to Beach Hill, which was upgraded between 1822 and 1832 to become a proper road to Beach Hill. And here is where it was extended. And this is Governor's Lake. So I you know, haven't shown the whole thing, but it basically shows the principle of how uh, the purple section came to be abandoned and this other section became the modern road. Now, before we completely um, uh, leave this aside, uh, it's a point of interest, even though it happened a little later than my 1850 cutoff date, uh, this red line shows the original alignment of that uh, upgraded road to Beach Hill. It followed very closely where the chain lakes uh, were situated at that time. However, the water, uh, Halifax water needed to raise the level of chain lakes at around this time, 1893. And so they had to realign the road. So really this uh, new alignment is where more or less, to some extent where the road runs today. And the red one, the original one, is no longer there. In fact, most of that red one is now underwater, although uh, when the water levels are lower, you, you can see some of the vestiges of, of that original alignment. So this is today's alignment, and it dates uh, roughly 1900, when they finally finished that, that realignment and, and raised the lake level. OK, so enough of the Bay Road. And let's talk about something different, the road to Cobequid. Uh, the British began that survey in 1755, which I pointed out earlier, of the road to Cobequid, uh, and it departed the Windsor Road at what at uh, what was then the Fultz Inn. Today it's the Fultz House, Fultz House Museum, which I highly recommend uh, that you visit, even if you've been there before. I, I go often. I really love that little museum, uh, and that segment is still called the Cobequid Road. Interesting. So. Um, that's where the Cobbequid Road gets its name. It really did go to Cobbequid originally. And so we're back to the 1755 map and you can see here where that was going around the Northwest side of uh, Grand Lake. Uh, now the Shubenacke River at that point was only crossed once near what became Fort Ellis and that was downstream of the Stuyak River. So they were only, they only needed to cross it uh, that one time. Uh, I don't know if there was a ferry or if they could ford it. It seems like it would be kind of deep after the Stuyak or downstream of the Stuyak, but maybe they could ford it. I I'm not sure. Um, yeah, here, here's that, uh, again, that one we looked at earlier. So even though this is a little unrealistic, these straight lines, it does show this crossing, whether it's a ford or a ferry, uh, just below Fort Ellis or at Fort Ellis pretty much. Uh, now here it is again more realistically, and again we've seen this one already. So the question is though, where did it um, did it always go around Grand Lake? We know it. We know that it no longer goes around the northwest side of Grand Lake. So instead, they decided to cross the brook at the south end of Shubenacadie Lake at Wellington, uh, and then after that, stay on the east side of Shubenacadie River. So that did improve the route. Uh, we're going to see that on a map in a minute. But then 
they improved it further by crossing at Fletcher's Bridge, which is further south at the south end of Fletcher's Lake. Uh, and a, uh, a wide arc was kind of taken inland to enable fording the Stewiak River at a propitious uh, spot. All right, so this 1784 map shows that Cobbequid Road um, starting here. This, this, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the Windsor Road, Cobbequid Road. Sorry about all this jumping. Uh, I've lost my road. All right, this is what I want. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, this one crosses at Wellington. This is Grand Lake. So the road stays on the west side of Williams Lake and Fletcher's Lake. Uh, it crosses at Wellington south of Grand Lake and then follows here to the east of the Shubenacadie River. All right, so now this is a little further, 1834, and I've highlighted it in green because it's so many roads on this one, it's hard to pick out the one we're talking about. This one does cross at Fletcher's Bridge, just south of Fletcher's Lake, and uh, comes up to uh, Oakfield here. And then, um, oh yeah, Carol's on uh, on the call. She uh, she has often explored this old road here and, and invited me to, to check it out. And I really would like to at some point. But uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of fun tracing out these old uh, roads. Anyway, so this one would then stay on the east side of Shubenacadie River uh, and, and take this wide arc and then cross the Stuyak here. And then you're on a beeline at that point to uh, Cobbequid or Truro. So later still, the preferred co uh, crossing was moved to Waverly. And sure enough, that is where the modern Cobbequid Road still, uh, to still runs from. Uh, Fultz is into the bridge at Waverly. Uh, and after that, today, Highway 2 crosses the Shuby River twice and also crosses the Stuyak because, you know, bridges are in place and it's not that big of a deal as modern construction. So priorities change and uh, alignments change to take advantage of um, technology and economy. All right, so the last uh, set of roads I want to talk about are the Dartmouth roads. Um, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because um, I'm sure you're probably ready for a break at this point, but we'll just uh, mention the Dartmouth roads, so just not to leave them completely out. Uh, I'm not um, as expert in the Dartmouth side of things. Um, probably. Uh, David Jones could probably fill in a lot of blanks uh, on the Dartmouth side, but uh, basically because there were no bridges on the Dartmouth side, things revolved around the ferry terminals. Uh, you, you were gonna, um, you, the ferries were the focal point of, of the Dartmouth roads. And sure enough, old ferry road in Dartmouth leads to uh, Creighton's ferry uh, terminal, uh, but by 1815, there was a second ferry wharf uh, coming off the downtown. So this is not a period map. This is a later sketch by uh, Eaton, uh, but it's meant to portray what is found on older maps. And it shows two ferry roads, uh, one from Creighton's Ferry here at Old Ferry Road to Halifax, and then this other ferry route to the downtown wharf at Dartmouth. Uh, and so there were these two roads. There was the Preston Road, which uh, the 107 uh, or the number seven follows inland. And there was the Coal Harbor Road, which is today Highway 207. And eventually they meet up either at uh, Mineville or, uh, uh, or uh, Porter's Lake or Lawrencetown. There's, there's three crossroads that sort of join together, but on the west side of Porter's Lake is your last chance. That, they definitely join up if you haven't joined them sooner. But um, this uh, square here, we can just zoom in on that for a second just to show some of the detail. Uh, so the Preston Road by 1815 had been given a new alignment. And here it's referred to as the new Preston Road. 
whereas the old Preston Road uh, ran somewhat beside it. So um, this would be the new Preston Road that came directly from downtown Dartmouth along Prince Albert Road. And uh, I'm not sure about all of the other modern names. This is Albert Lake here. Uh, so that was the new Preston Road, whereas the old Preston Road branched off from the Coal Harbor Road somewhere around uh, Lake Lawn. And, uh, and so that was the old Preston Road around Mount, Mount Edward. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why you have Mount Edward Road sort of running parallel to uh, the uh, Main Street uh, now. Interesting history. Now, again, this map is a little bit past my, my timeline cutoff of uh, 1850, but just to show 1886, you know, there's a lot more going on, but really those two main roads have, have been fairly stable. Uh, you've got the Preston Road, which you now know as Main Street, and uh, Portland Street here in downtown Dartmouth, which, uh, uh, well, there's also uh, Pleasant Street down here, <coughs> And uh, I think this would be uh, Gaston Road over here, uh, Portland uh, Street, uh, eventually becoming the Coal Harbor Road. And uh, here you have the, uh, the road to Cow Bay. Um, the name for it has just left my memory all of a sudden, but anyway, it's a very familiar road as well. Uh, so yeah, so Dartmouth was a busy place too. So in conclusion, for some people, myself especially, the subject of old abandoned roads appears to have endless fascination. And especially when an abandoned and overgrown alignment can be discovered out in the woods or some other wild area. I love doing that. Finding the story behind it and how that connects with our modern world seems to bring a particular feeling of connection with a distant but visceral past. And so thank you very much. That is my talk. Thank you so much, Terry. That one had so many good maps. Like, there's some maps in there that I have not seen before. Okay. Which is really crazy. I'm going to, um, I'd like to invite anyone who has questions to please place them in the chat and I will uh, read them off to Terry. But while I'll give everyone a chance to put some questions in, I'm going to announce the results of the uh, vote really quickly. Um, um, Sarah Ingram will remain the president, that's me. Uh, Kirsten Green will remain the vice president. Um, Kyle Seglotti will remain the treasurer. Terry, you will remain secretary. You did it. Um, for the directors at large, there's six positions. Those positions have been awarded to um, Mikhail Basque, Travis Crowell, David Jones, Logan Robertson, Wesley Weatherby, and Emma Kemp. So um, that's basically all returns, but Emma, Emma is new. Welcome Emma to the uh, executive. Um, that's the results. Um, do we have any questions for Terry? Mostly just some very interesting and great talks. I have a question for Terry. David Jones, hit it. Hi, Terry. I just want to say that was one of my favorite NSAS talks. Okay. It was so well illustrated and you're really passionate. I've known that for a long time. I want to know, when did you first get into looking for old roads and trails? Does that go back to your childhood growing up like down in the Clare area or more in the city? When did this first really pique your interest? That's my question. Oh, absolutely. As a kid, as a kid. I mean, uh, where I grew up in Clare in, uh, in Lake Dowsett, which is part of Digby County, um, it was a, a very um, busy, if not prosperous, I'm not sure how prosperous it was. I think it was fairly prosperous uh, agricultural area uh, back uh, in, in the 19th century. And of course, they had a lot of fields that were cleared, a lot of stone walls, a lot of roads linking them going way, way back in the land, but then it fell into disuse and became completely overgrown and, and forested over. So as a young kid, you know, almost as soon as I could walk, I, I was exploring all these old abandoned roads and, and walls and um, even mill site and that sort of thing way back in the woods, lost orchards. So 
Yeah, it's in, it's been bred in the bone, I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, I've got um, a qu I've got actually two questions from Jenny Rose. Uh, the first is, what details can you provide about the physical description? Um, it says she says of an Indian path. So I don't know if she's specifically talking about the Indian road that you messaged or just like indigenous paths in general. And I'm going to tag on to that one. Her other question is, did the Mi'kmaq mark trees? Yeah. Well, the second one I think is easier to answer because it does appear that they did, and it's a well known. Um, sort of behavior or, or uh, technology almost uh, for, for uh, native people all across North America that they would uh, twist branches or trunks into kind of pretzel shapes or maybe not quite that severe, but, and, and let them grow that way so that um, these were the um, Indian trees that, that uh, had different meanings. Now, there may have even been a symbology, you know, the, the shape of the bends and the trees could have meant something. I don't know that for sure, but people speculate about that. Uh, so yeah, the trees were, were marked that way. Uh, I don't know, you know, there's, I don't think there's a definitive uh, reference for that. If there is, I'd like to know what it is, but I think it's more sort of informal. Like you, you find these things and you realize somebody did that. And uh, it's well known that uh, Mi'kmaq and, and other native traditions uh, did, did do that. Uh, in terms of the path, that is a really tricky one, of course, because um, deer use paths that people make, and if the people stop using them, they become deer trails. And people will use paths that deer make. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, ATV people use the paths also, and the paths are continually being uh, modified by use, whether it's by animal use or people use, and of course becoming overgrown. Uh, so it's it's a very dynamic thing. So to try to find a path in the woods and say, okay, there there definitely was this was an Indian path. Um, the best way is to find some documentary evidence of it, and sometimes that does exist. But just to go and find a path in the woods and say, okay, this is an Indian path, it's it's oh, I don't know. I'm not skilled enough to say it definitively, but a lot of times you wonder, you wonder, you say, well, we can't really think of who else would have made this path other than deer and, um, and Mi'kmaq. So yeah, it's, it's mostly speculative, I would say, but, but then again, I am not a Mi'kmaq. It, it may be that if you talk to somebody like Roger Lewis, he could, uh, he could actually tell you, oh yeah, we know, we, we know how to tell, but I don't. Terry, before I move on to the next question, I will say I might have some information that I could share with you about culturally modified trees, if you're oh, interested. Great. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Carol has asked, um, the Sweps Trails group has been working to improve trails in the Shubenacadie watershed area. We've been working with a group trying to upgrade the Wellington to Oakfield section, but we're battling between walkers and the motorized guys. Any comments? Yeah, I'm probably not a good one to ask because I've, I've had my encounters with them as well. And my wife tells me I did not handle it very well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think 90% of the uh, four-wheeler people are, are you know, um, well-meaning and cooperative and try to, try to do the right thing. And it's always the one or two that, um, you know, make trouble that, that kind of give the group a bad name. So. I mean, I, uh, I think the thing to do is to work with the trail association, like the, the actual motorized trail association. And, and usually the people in those formal groups are, are really keen for, to be cooperative and to have uh, you know, good lines of, of uh, cooperation between the hikers and, and the drivers. So that's the only thing I would suggest, like try to reach out uh, to those, uh, to those um, you know, fan, or not fan is not the right word, but those recreational groups, that, those formal organizations to try to, uh, to try to smooth things over. Maybe I could just make another comment there. <laughs> because um, uh, a lot of the funding that SWEPS has got for their trail development, they've done a lot of development of trails um, coming out of Dartmouth towards um, Wellington. Uh, Wellington uh, has been through HRM funding and they will only fund non-motorized trails. So we did have somebody from HRM walked 
particular trail I'm interested in, which is the Grand Lake to Oakfield bit. And it has some old rock walls in there. It has some of the original, um, what do they call that? Where, where there they were originally boards across, logs across. Uh, corduroy. Corduroy, yeah. And part of it uh, could be quite nice, but um, a lot of it is sadly torn up by ATVs and God knows what else. And of course, they don't want to go for AM funding <laughs> because they, they want it to be motorized. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure where we're going to end up with that one. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I think it's in some places they've been able to get parallel uh, or somewhat parallel trails mm -hmm. so, so people can be separated. I don't know if that would possibly work in, in your case there or not. But I agree, yeah, it's challenging. Don't see any other questions in the chat. If anyone has something that just popped into their brains, please <laughs> share. Oh, another uh, thing I found very interesting. And, yeah, sorry, why don't you get me talking? You can't shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> I found it very interesting that uh, we had been wondering, sort of between us, what the origin of that road was. And you're suggesting a lot of them started as Indian trails and then were more maybe military ones. I, I, I don't know. Right. Well, um, there definitely were trails. I mean, if anything was of interest, uh, whether it was a watershed or uh, a game area or hunting area or fishing area, you know, the, the Mi'kmaq would have been interested in it. They would have made a path or a portage to get from A to B. So, you know, if you go back far enough, there was probably a Mi'kmaq trail from almost anywhere to almost anywhere, you know, but they, if they're not used, they don't necessarily survive. Some are kept up as by the deer themselves. Uh, so it almost goes without saying that just about every interesting place to go, there was a Mi'kmaq trail going there at one point in time. Um, but yeah, it, 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 trails are in a state of flux always. I mean, trees grow up and, and then they, they become windblown. And so uh, even those major roads, you know, just from tree throws sometimes become untraceable, let alone uh, smaller paths. It's, it's a very dynamic situation, but that's the fun of it to, um, to sort of overcome those uh, interpretation challenges and, and, and find those alignments uh, and interpretations uh, despite the challenges. Yeah, well, this trail has been in existence ever since I've lived here. Right. Uh, well, a long time, obviously a long time before that. So who would have put it in the corduroy? Uh, well, it would have been the British um, making that Cobblewood Road. And, and that was realigned several times. So it, it wouldn't be just one necessarily, I mean, it may have been just one, but it wouldn't necessarily have been just one alignment. You could find several uh, versions of the Cobblequid Road going through that area. Um, so the, inside the number two would have been another, another part of that then? Yeah, well, the number quote unquote two actually went different places at different times. I am uh going to uh, just mention Rob Ferguson just said that Joseph Howe has some great descriptions yes. of these old roads. Um, uh, where is, okay. So Jenny has asked, uh, were Acadian roads like Grand Pre just dirt or reinforced with logs or other structures to strengthen? No, they were just definitely dirt. Um, yeah, they, they did not spend hardly any time on their own roads at the, their approach was to try to walk softly on those roads so they wouldn't be torn up. You know, the um, oxen don't walk very fast. And uh, if you use big wheels in your carts, you don't necessarily damage the road too much. I think that was their approach. Rather than make a strong road, they just tried to minimize how much they were damaging a soft road. Um, so we've got one last question from, I'm not sure if his name is pronounced Guy or Guy, apologies on the pronunciation, but just before I ask the last question, um, I'd just like to point out Kyle Sliglotti has mentioned that um, when we're talking about the Mi'kmaq, it's preferable that uh, we refer to the indigenous people of Mi'kmaq instead of Indian. 
just as a point of reference, as we move forward, it's something that, um, oh, thank you, David Jones guys and cool guy. It's something um, that, you know, just someone who works in archeology, span I work heavily with Cam Kano. It's something that I'm just a little aware of. No need to apologize. This is how we learn. I just wanted to uh, bring attention to Kyle's comment. Um, right. And then I'll- I'd like I'll to say something about that. You know, I totally agree. Uh, however, when you're referring to historical documents, if, if it's actually printed that way, you, you have to you have to quote it that way. And but you know, obviously, it is not correct in today's usage. Absolutely, yes, totally agree. It definitely can become um, an interesting uh, dynamic when you're writing a report and you're sort of switching back and forth based on either historical documentation or current discussion of the land. Um, um, oh yes, and Lynn has made a point that we also had Maliseet people here as well as Passamaquoddy. So of course, you know, there's a lot of things to consider for sure, but I'm gonna close it out with uh, Guy's uh, last question. Um, he's wondering if you looked at Ben Pence's MA on portage routes when you were working on this lecture. No, no. I mean, oh. the only, I mean, I know I'm aware of Ben Pence's study of uh, the uh, Mercy watershed and uh, um, Elaine's Brook watershed, but I'm not sure if that's the one you're referring to, or, or if he has another one. I'd be really interested in getting a hold of a copy if, if there's. Well, in fact, I don't even have a copy of this first one. So yeah, anything by Ben Pence, I would like to have a copy. I'm sure that we can get you in contact with him, Terry. All right. Um, okay, so that will end our lecture. I would like to thank everyone for coming out today and for um, voting in the AGM. I can't with that cat, Rob, too cute. Um, thank you all for voting in the AGM. Thank you for attending this past lecture. Um, for those of you who are not aware, this is the last lecture of our lecture series for the year. We will be on hold until September. Um, and so please stay tuned to our Facebook. Um, we'll make sure that we share what's upcoming as we get closer to that time. Um, I hope everyone has a very safe and hopefully vaccinated and socially distanced summer. Hopefully we can get out and enjoy some time with friends and family again um, and uh, have a good night. Thank you guys all so much for coming. And thank you again, Terry, for the wonderful lecture. Yes, and thank you. And if I could just have one last word in edgeways there is Go to, ahead. As a secretary of the board, I want to thank the whole board for a, a great year and working very hard for all our objectives and especially you, Sarah, as president, you've done a great job and we're all behind you. So thank you very much. Good, Thanks good so much, you guys. All right, everyone have a great evening. Thanks again.